Welcome everybody back to the second episode of This Is Us Tuesday. And we're gonna just dive right in and kind of pick up the story. And, and I put a picture out there on Instagram of the driveway, the infamous driveway. Kind of holds a, you know, significant meaning in our life. And you wanna tell like where that was and time-wise? It was our first house. Before that we had rented from apartments to duplexes and it was the first house that we ever felt like settled in. Jay was about seven months old when we moved in there and M was like five, five and a half. And then we're gonna pick up the, the story or the events in 2002. So Jay would have been like between a year. One and, and a half probably. And Emily. Probably six, between six and seven. And Joey not yet born. Um, so we were in the process of actually selling that house um, at that point and we were getting ready to, to build a new house down the street and move from a two-story to a ranch. And uh, my parents also lived on a different road in the neighborhood. One night back in 2002 and Stephanie got a phone call. I'll let you tell this part. Um, Justin's mom called. She usually called me because she liked me better. and. She was real upset, frantic, and I could tell she had been crying, and she asked if they could come over, and I said yes, and we ran outside to our driveway to meet up with them so we could hear what they had to say and stuff. So we met them out in the driveway, and uh, basically my mom was crying, upset, my dad was with her, and she said, uh, Justin, uh, your brother, needs a heart if he doesn't get one he's gonna die you need to do something um you need to save your brother we were just kind of like blown away we two months about two or three months prior um he had a just a normal sinus infection that he didn't treat and just kind of got real run down and it caused damage to his heart caused it to be enlarged i guess they call it cardiomyopathy and so she was basically telling us that this night that he needed three thousand dollars a month uh, for his anti-rejection medicine for them to even consider him or to get his heart transplant. We were living in that house, we had two cars, we had two car payments, a house payment, um, credit card, probably living beyond our means and we're building another house. Um, I was working uh, with a major insurance company and I specialized in helping people with their estate planning, all seniors 65 and up, and Stephanie was a stay-at-home mom and watching the kids and like I said, we were planning on having our third child and I was making okay money, uh, but it was all commission based and you know, I had to go out and sell policies or do investments because uh, I was licensed to do that as well. Um, so I was just under a huge amount of you know, financial pressure and I don't want you to take this as an excuse uh, for anything that happens uh, down the road in the story, but I just wanted to kind of set it up and explain you know, the situation that we were in and kind of how we felt at the time. You know, it's a time where you are where I personally, you know, definitely prayed. Um, you know, we're both, um, we're both saved and we both, you know, believe in God. And I definitely prayed, you know, that Jason would get a heart and that he would be healed um, and that, you know, he would have a, you know, a long life. He had kids and things like that. Um, but looking back now, to be honest with you, you know, I should have trusted God even more and leaned on, you know, my faith, you know, to, to count on him for, you know, the financial part of it as well. And I didn't do that. I kind of took it upon myself. And at the time I was matched up with a, um, certified estate planner that had his own office. You know, he showed me a lot of different things and a lot of different planning tools with setting up trust and different you know, corporations and gifts and a lot of advanced type of stuff. Um, and so one of my clients was you know, a senior and you know, through her planning that we had already done in the years past, she didn't have any kind of relatives. You know, all of our planning was geared towards you know, setting up that her church would receive the you know, insurance benefits and things like that upon her passing. And when all of this was going on, you know, I reached out to her and started kind of sharing our, my situation and 
you know, just kind of proposed a plan and said, hey, if you would consider doing this, and, and my proposal was essentially that we would transfer, you know, money that she had in an account that she wasn't, you know, using, um, that she was planning on leaving after her passing, and transferred it into my account. And in exchange for that, I agreed that I would take out a life insurance policy that she had to sign for and, you know, get underwritten for and, um, you know, have her physical taken and we set up a life insurance policy that was significantly more than the money that I transferred into my account and the agreement was that if I would make the premiums on her behalf until the policy was either paid in full or until she passed away you know it was a way for me in my eyes in that time you know I looked at it like I was basically taking a loan from her so she was completely competent she knew what was going on she knew my situation I had been you know dealing with her on a personal level for you know several years prior to this and so we made that agreement and you know that's that's how i viewed it at that time and i want to say the life insurance upon her passing you were not the beneficiary no so her family would have got it would have went a to her substantial church. amount more of money right than what you had commingled yeah so right. we set it up the same way as what everything else was set up that the benefit would have been paid out to the church upon her passing and i also want to say um you know we told how his mom was like frantic and stuff and not at all are we blaming this on her she didn't you know sh she always came to us and we always came to her we were like best friends with his mom and dad and you know i don't feel like she was to blame or put pressure she probably made you feel like she put pressure on you but it wasn't her fault it was completely our fault right i'm also not you know saying that what i did was not wrong i do know that it was wrong um, i take full responsibility today just as i did when it happened however i will say that i had no uh inclination that what i was doing was illegal um i did know that i was kind of crossing the line and that I was jeopardizing the possibility of losing my, my insurance license and, and losing my job. Um, and so I did make a bad choice uh, and I did do the wrong thing in that situation. That's, I'm just telling you exactly what happened and what I did. The money was transferred over, um, two or three years had passed. I make, made the payments on the life insurance and there was two other instances where she had asked for additional money back to pay for this or this that or the other and and i did that and that was also part of the agreement that if she ever needed access to you know the money that was transferred then i would you know give that back when she when she needed it and two or three years had passed and it was actually two days short of being three years that my brother had received his heart so i missed that so jason actually was put on the heart transplant list and you know about seven or eight months had passed and he did receive his heart. Everything went well with his surgery and you know, he, he did have to you know, not work for a while, was on disability and he, you know, we, we did step up and help with his kids and things like that and helped him get a house. And that's you know, what we used a majority of the money for that we had, had taken. And about three years had passed, well it was two days short, short of yeah. being three years from the date he got his heart. Um, I'll let you start and <laughs> take this over. We got a call and said they were rushing him to the hospital and um, he passed away in the hospital. We had called our pastor to um, come to the hospital because we were all like just freaking out and devastated and real upset he had told us you know something that's kind of stuck with us to this day inch by inch life's a cinch yard by yard life is hard and you know i've thought about like that the whole time justin was in prison you know that's one of the things i always thought about so we actually found out what had happened was that his organs had shut down and that he basically just choked on his own blood and they weren't able to do anything for him. You know, we continue to, to be there and support, you know, his family that was left behind. And not too long after that, um, 
I received probably two to three weeks, I received a phone call from my client asking if I could go out and talk to her. And so I drove to the town that she lived in and you know knocked on the front door and she let me in. And when I went in, there was two other individuals that were there that I'd never seen before. And they introduced themselves. They were some type of really distant relatives that had pretty much just come out of the woodwork uh, because she was getting up in age and it, you know, like I said, time had passed and they started digging into a lot of her finances and different transactions and things that she had done. So they had a lot of questions for me and they came across some things that didn't look just quite right to them. I basically, you know, panicked, you know, that was kind of my oh crap moment that, you know, I'm not going to have a job, you know, how am I going to support my family and I got to figure out how to fix this. So I cut the meeting short and told them that I would get back to them. Went out of there and I called Stephanie and I kind of told her what was going on at that point. Do you remember? I you really me? don't remember. Um, I remember a lot, but a lot's also like a blur, you know? I was like, how can I fix this? So I, the only thing I could come up with is, you know, we, meaning Stephanie and I, and also my parents were doing a lot to help you know, Jason through his time up until his passing and then afterwards with his family. We were living in a house that was bigger than what we needed, more expensive than we probably should have built. We had two large sport utility vehicles, both had loans on them. Again, living beyond our means. Had three kids at that point of our own, plus a golden retriever. Um, but we we didn't have the, the money to pay this back and it was, in the neighborhood of $200,000 that we're talking about. That's what was transferred from uh, her account to mine. So I knew I couldn't call my parents and I call, end up calling Stephanie's dad and I was like, you know, panicked. I just said, you know, here's the situation. I'm in a bind and asked, you know, if there's any way that he could help, you know, give me a loan, I'll pay it back any way I can, but I had to fix this and fix it quick. Otherwise it was gonna be a problem. The answer I kind of got was, <laughs> Well, you knew it was going to be a long shot, right? <laughs> but pretty much you made your bed. Now you're going to lie in it. And we understood, you know, that's probably was a good thing. Looking back, probably better that we had to go through what we went through. So we trying to figure things out on our own and it, it probably wasn't another day or two uh, or maybe a week. And we started getting the, the inclination that they had then passed the um, situation onto the police in their town and that they were going to start an investigation on the transaction that took place. One day I know I went into the bank at our local bank and I was just gonna make like a regular deposit or withdraw or whatever it was, nothing significant. And they said, you know, Mr. Carroll, you can't access your accounts. And I was like, why not? And we found out that they froze all of our bank accounts. And so that was just one more thing that we had to deal with. We found out that they were doing an investigation and that they were talking about bringing charges against not just me, but Stephanie as well. And they basically said since her name was on a bank account and she was married to me that, you know, that she was also accountable. Stephanie had never been in contact with this person, didn't know exactly what it all transpired. She'd never talked to the person by phone or in person. She'd never been to the town that this happened in, but she was still being, you know, charged as well. So we had to get attorneys. Um, we had to get two separate attorneys. And back when this happened, we neither one had ever been in trouble, never had to have an attorney represent us. So it was like, how do you even know what kind of attorney to contact? And Come to find out, the attorneys we had were blue collar cr uh, criminal attorneys. We were told after this that we should have had like white collar uh, attorneys, but I don't know if it would have made a difference or not. We each had to pay $10,000 to two attorneys to represent us. And we were doing everything to get our hands on whatever money we could as far as to take care of our legal stuff. I mean, we had to scrape together everything and figure it out. I think we are in year 2006, I believe. Mm -hmm. July uh, 19th turning to July 20th. And it would have been uh, Jay's sixth, sixth, birthday. sixth birthday. And we are, you know, we hired the attorneys. You know, we were told that charges were going to be uh, brought against us. 
Um, there was a brand new prosecutor that was trying to make a name for herself in this town. They were coming after us and... Well, yeah, and we were told that they were going to let us turn ourselves in. Since we had attorneys, they were going to make sure that and we were going to be able to turn ourselves in and not get just arrested, you know. Yeah, they knew we, we obviously were married, had a family, had kids, had a house. We weren't going anywhere and we were acknowledging that these charges were coming and had the attorneys representing us and they were in talks with the you know the county and the prosecutor. We knew it was just a matter of time that we were gonna have to turn ourselves in but on July 20th at four in the morning, three or four in the morning. Yeah, well, it was the 19th overnight. Right. So yeah, three, three, four in the morning, the doorbell rings and I jumped out of bed. I looked out the blinds and I was like, Justin, the police are here. And he was like, oh crap. And he had to get up. But before he got out of bed, I ran to the front door. Big mistake. I should have went pee first. I ran to the front door and opened it because I didn't want them to keep ringing the doorbell and wake the kids up. They handcuffed me right away. And I asked, can I go pee? And they were like, no. And back then I didn't understand, you know, why I couldn't go to the bathroom real quick. But now I get it, you know. And I had hurried up and grabbed a phone and called my parents because they lived right down the street. And they were able to come down uh, really quickly in the middle of the night to sit with the kids. And we were both basically being put in the back of the police car to be taken to the local jail. And it was in the back of the police car that one of the police officers made a comment. They were like, wow, you guys are really a big deal. And I was like, what are you talking about? And he said, we've never seen anybody with a bail so high. You each have a million dollars of bail for each of you um, in our system. And that's why we came in the middle of the night to come pick you up. This has been, like I said, crazy part of our life. And it's really just getting started. I wanna thank everybody for coming back to listen to the part two. And we will pick this up uh, next week on Tuesday. And if you haven't already, uh, please subscribe. And you will get, and turn your notifications on and you will get notified when episode number three comes. Thanks for watching. And by the way, we'll take thumbs up or thumbs down. Uh, last of all, I just want to say, we're not saying any of this to, to basically say it was okay or what we did, or we're not trying to say anything like that. And we know that anybody out there viewing this or that knew us personally at the time, um, you know, they're going to think what they're going to think. You know, we lost a lot of what we thought were friends. Family members don't talk to us. Neighbors stop talking to us. And, you know, I'm sure there's people on here watching that already have their minds made up that, you know, these are these are bad people or whatever. That's okay. We, and that's okay. Yeah, we wanted to share mainly because Em gets a lot of questions about it. And it's something that we can talk about now. And let you guys know like what we went through and if you have questions we'll probably do like a Q&A so if you want to leave your questions below go ahead we'll... and leave your questions in the comment section and we will start working on a Q&A uh, coming up as well yeah well thanks everybody when